I'm with the, <laughs> I'm with the uh, Center for a New American Dream. And um, first of all, you know, I just want to let everybody who's on the call know that um, this uh, session is going to be recorded and we'll be making the recording available on our website for others to download, including the folks who possibly RSVP, but um, haven't been able to, um, to make it to the event today. So um, stay tuned for that. Hopefully by Friday, it's going to be available. Um, um, so welcome everyone to the Center for a New American Dreams webinar series. Um, you know, many of you have participated in our past events and I know we have a number of new folks. So I'm going to start really briefly with a quick overview of the Center for a New American Dream and our get together initiative. So uh, as many of you know, New Dream's mission is overall to help people shift their consumption habits and enhance their quality of life. And we've been doing this since uh, the organization was launched in 1997, so about 20 years. And we've worked in various different areas around um, the whole issue of uh, overconsumption. Um, most recently, we launched uh, the Get Together initiative because our members came to us after making changes in their own lives. and. Uh, they were beginning to look around for other like-minded folks who they could work with to make broader changes where they live in their own community. So, you know, we would often hear, you know, are there any other new dreamers like me? And, you know, who can I work with in my neighborhood to make various different changes? And so our response to that has been get together and we provide two things mainly. Um, we provided an online platform where they can find each other. And then second, um, we provide step-by-step -step guides on how you can make changes in your local community. And so um, our hope is that by, you know, hosting this webinar around Plastic Solution, um, we'll be able to really galvanize folks around the country around this issue. Um, our work in the area of plastic pollution began with our Unbottled Water campaign, which we launched um, in, I believe it was um, late last year. And so we have the Unbottled Water campaign and we're hoping to expand to other forms of plastic pollution in the upcoming months. And so that's just kind of a general overview. I encourage everyone to uh, check out our website, newdream.org slash uh, get together and join and be engaged. Um, today, we're honored to have three guest speakers who I'm really excited about. Um, you know, all these folks have been working tirelessly to help people shift away from using um, one time use plastic bags. And I just love it because I live in the um, uh, DC metro area. And I remember Chris, <laughs> um, I was skeptical um, several years ago when I believe it was Whole Foods that was leading the way and they said they were never going to use any more of the plastic bags and I, you know, I wondered about that and I've been pleasantly surprised and um, I hope that we'll be able to see what's happening in the DC area everywhere else and what's going on in Chicago and I've been hearing from so many different folks around the country about initiatives where they live and I'd love to see it everywhere nationwide. So uh, today we have uh, Jordan Parker from Bring Your Back Chicago, um, Chris Keebler from the Department of the Environment and oh, Department of Energy and the Environment in Washington, DC. And then Jenny Romer, who is our legislative and legal guru um, from Plastic Bag Laws org and she's probably going to share a lot of what's going on in New York City as well. So welcome everyone. We're, um, we'll start off with Jordan and I'll tell you a little bit about Jordan. She first volunteered nearly four years ago while she was working full time as a fitness professional in Chicago. And after working as a grassroots activist for a year and a half, she founded Bring Your Bag Chicago in the spring of 
2013. So that was just two years ago. And a lot has happened since then. Um, she's worked with environmental advocates all around the country. Uh, she planned the Chicago Climate March in the fall of 2014. And she's been extremely busy over the past several weeks representing Bring Your Back Chicago as the media spokesperson around the most recent um, bag ordinance uh, that went into effect, uh, I guess it was eight weeks ago, August 1, 2015. And she's going to share some insights um, from the experience there. So welcome, Jordan. Um, yeah. Great to be here. I'm so excited that this many people are interested in this issue. Um, so can everybody see that? All right. Um, there we go. Okay, so Okay, so how do I scroll forward with the slides? Jordan, if you um Put your arrow down at the bottom of the um, of the PowerPoint. There should be a, a little arrow. You see it? Yep. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I've read statistics that state each American uses between 330 and 600 single-use bags a year, and so based on an average of 500 bags per person. Chicagoans consume 2,568 bags every minute. So what you see in this photo here is an art installation, Bring Your Bag Chicago, created in 2013 called the Plastic Bag Canopy. And it's made up of 85 strands, 30 foot long strands of twine stringing 30 plastic bags end to end, which adds up to 2,568 bags. So a few years ago, I read a book called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard by Chip and Dan Heath. And what they talk about in the book is how to motivate people and how everyone has a rational mind and an emotional mind. And the rational mind is represented by a rider on top of the emotional mind represented by an elephant. So in order to motivate change, you need to get both the rider and the elephant headed in the same direction. And so this, um, this art installation did a really, really good job of using facts to move people emotionally. I'll go on to the next slide. Um, and about the same time that Chip and Dan Heath wrote their book, an author, Simon Sinek, created the model for inspirational leadership. And this is called the Golden Circle. He's um, talked about this in a TED Talk that's been the third most watched TED Talk on TED. And um, what it says basically is that any organization um, knows essentially what they do. Some organizations know how they do it, but few organizations actually know why they're doing something. So what I find really compelling about this in particular is that um, when you look under why, it's not that um, this is really about money. Money is an after effect. This is about purpose. It's about the cause. It's about the belief. So when we ask ourselves why, we ask ourselves why we're all here today. I think it's because we know that our current disposable age is completely unsustainable. We need to shift from thinking only about the self to thinking about the system as a whole. So we need to change our thinking and change our behavior in order to live sustainably with our planet. And when you look at that, that is um, a pretty enormous undertaking that is related to this little issue of bags. So the deeper why is that we need to move from an individualistic lifestyle to a collectivist lifestyle. And that means thinking about our waste and taking personal responsibility for our waste. And obviously this is a, a huge hill to climb, but something that helps me maintain perspective when I feel defeated um, is that it wasn't until 2000, believe this or not, 
that smoking was completely banned on all U.S. domestic and international flights. So at one point in time, it was completely normal to light up a cigarette on an airplane. <laughs> and when we think about that now, it just seems crazy. So I think in um, you know several decades, we're going to look back at this time in history and think going through all these plastic utensils, plastic water bottles, plastic coffee cups, plastic bags, all of this disposable single-use waste, we're going to think it was absolutely crazy at some point. Um, so specifically, why bags? Why bags when there are so many other issues to tackle? Um, for one, it's current. So this bag situation, this bag issue became, became an issue just in the past few decades when we started to usher in this era of disposables. And obviously it's, it's relevant to waste and it's also relevant to energy because plastic bags are made from natural gas or oil and paper bags are obviously made from paper and compostable bags are made from energy intensive, intensive corn crops. So this all relates back to energy, which relates directly to climate change, which comes back to us. How do we live sustainably with our, with our world? So unlike climate change, bags are accessible. This is an accessible issue. I think when people hear about climate change, for example, they often tune out because it's just, it's too big. It's not so easy to just go do something about climate change. So people become a little bit paralyzed, but bags touch our lives on a daily or weekly basis. We can see them, we can touch them, and they're a direct part of our day-to-day -day living. So because of this, I see, I see bags as kind of a gateway issue to a higher consciousness around sustainability issues. If we can get people to say, I can touch this, I can feel this, I can bring my own bag, I can be part of the solution, I can do something small, maybe we can get them to, to think that they can be part of the solution to other bigger problems than this. So we've covered the why. So now let's go to the how. And um, uh, as you see on this, and you see on the slide, as you see on the slide, I think that any solid campaign is made up of two different branches, the legislative or policy branch and the public education or you know, awareness branch. So both solid policy and public education are about building relationships. And solid policy first begins with the legislation you choose to introduce. And Jenny Romer, who you'll hear from in a few moments, is the leading national expert on this and how important solid, good policy is. And um, during the Q&A, I can talk a little bit about how in Chicago, we just passed a piece of legislation that is not good policy. And now I'm working my tail off to try to amend this. We actually testified against this piece of legislation, um, which is a straight ban on single-use plastic bags. It does nothing else. So. We testified against this last year. It was muscled through City Hall anyway, because we have a little bit of, um, we have some ulterior motives going on here. <laughs> surprise, surprise, in Chicago. Um, anyway, so I'll, I, I can get to that a little bit later in the Q&A if you guys are interested. But um, about legislation, the legislative branch, it's all about creating a strategy after that and building your coalition. Your coalition is made up of organizations, local organizations and environmental organizations, national enviros, retail merchants association and grocers associations, um, associations that represent the retailers. Um, council members, of course, are critical to lobby, to educate, to um, find champions. It's, it's critical to find champions for your cause. So at the same time, this, pub, this um, legislative branch is happening in your campaign, you've got the public education component other way, and that art installation is a really good example of public education. And this is about getting out into neighborhoods and talking to the people who live there and shop there. And um, last year, I heard the word clicktivist for the first time. A clicktivist is an activist who primarily is active by clicking. 
So like liking and liking things, sharing things, tweeting things, posting, that's all really valuable. Social media is really, really valuable, obviously, but I believe human contact is exponentially more powerful when it comes to change. So on to my sixth out of seven slides. Um, so how do we organize? How are, how are we going to organize um, once we have the concept of two branches, the policy and the community education, I think the best way to create a strong campaign with momentum is to find two to five people who can work closely together and commit five to 10 hours a week on this campaign. So take it on essentially as a part-time job. So when you look at this, um, when you look at this, this visual here, I see the little red guy and the little blue guy as um, like your leaders on the campaign. Maybe one of them is more artistic and works on the community education side. And one of them is more um, analytical and factual minded and works on the legislative side, just a thought. But you can see how it's important, it's critical to have organization and a hierarchy. Um, as you're running this campaign. If, if it's just a bunch of people together, um, it's really hard to get anywhere because there's no organization and everyone's trying to lead and no one's following up. And I went through that for about a year and a half <laughs> before I actually figured this out. So um, the challenge is creating and maintaining a structure in the organization in the context of everyone being a volunteer. But I believe a small nucleus of knowledgeable, inspirational leaders can motivate their volunteers based on a solid why that we talked about before. People will get involved because they are gaining experience, they're learning skills, they're having fun, and most of all, because they believe in the why. So on to the last slide. So now we've gone to the inner, we've gone through the inner circle of why, the next circle, which is how. And then the next circle, which is what? So what are we doing? Essentially, we're motivating consumers to rethink using single use bags once or twice and to begin using reusable bags at least two to 500 times each. That's our ultimate goal. Um, we're not talking just about plastic. We're talking about all types of disposable bags, paper, thicker plastic bags, and compostable plastic bags are a few examples. We want to motivate people to replace these disposable bags with one reusable bag that they, they, they can use hundreds of times each. So to conclude, the quote on our Facebook page right now is, small acts when multiplied by millions of people can transform the world. And I believe the road to sustainability can, be, can begin with just one bag and just one person. And so I thank you all so much for being that person today and for coming to this webinar. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so thanks, uh, Jordan. Uh, we're going to take a short break here and um, take any questions. If anyone has any questions about, you know, what's going on in Chicago, um, uh, you know, looking for any tips and insights, you can use the um, group chat function um, it's to the right, um, I believe, for most people. And um, just type in your questions, and um, we'll we'll take any questions along the way, and we'll stop after each presenter um, to take a couple of questions as well. Um, so you know, just kind of to start, uh, Jordan, I have a um, I'm interested in finding out from you, uh, you know, what you would say, uh, and I think you touched on it a little bit, um, what would you say uh, to the retailers about um, giving away these bags? Because I, I think I've been looking around and, um, you know, often retailers are in the business of selling things. And um, this is one of the things that they give away. Um, what, would, what, what would your message be? Uh, to retailers who are thinking about, who are co contemplating this um, legislation. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
That's a great question. And um, what I would say to retailers is we need to rethink this current system of giving away free bags. This is part of the old economy. This is a part, this is part of a fossil fuel based system. Um, this started sometime in the 60s or 70s where retailers decided to give away bags. But now what we're doing is we're asking the government to step in and mandate that retailers charge for any bag that they're giving away at the point of sale because it's a product just like anything else that they're that they're providing at their store. It's like gum, food, alcohol, cigarettes. It's a product they're providing, so they need to charge for it. This, this giving away of free bags is a system that needs to go. So if we can get people to shift their mindset about about what a bag actually is to it it's being it's a product and if they need a bag they can buy one and if they don't they don't have to buy one that's what i would say great okay so now we're going to move on to our next presenter um chris anna yes anna yes um, I've gotten a couple of questions. Um, unfortunately, they didn't come. It didn't come through the group chat, um, mm -hmm. so I could um, I could dictate them. Um, that's okay. okay. Yes, that's great. Um, one is from Randy Mail. Who? Well, hi, Randy. I uh, believe you're one of our board members. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, the question is: What kinds of thick plastic bags are allowed in Chicago, and do you think these are being reused? Hundreds of times? Absolutely not. <laughs> so we have a huge loophole in our ordinance. Again, this ordinance was muscled through city council last year and Bring Your Bag Chicago testified against it because of this huge loophole. And what it does is it just bans single use plastic bags, but it allows retailers to still give away three types of bags, paper bags, compostable plastic bags, which are another issue that I, I won't get into now, um, and thicker plastic reusable bags that meet the specifications of a reusable bag in the ordinance. So what retailers have done is they've complied with the law. It's a bad law that we just passed in Chicago. I'm not blaming retailers. So what they did is they switched to the next least expensive bag, which happened to be a thicker plastic bag with handles that meets the minimum specifications of a reusable bag in the ordinance. But because it's free, it has no value. So nobody's bringing them back and they're also extremely flimsy. So what we're confronting right now in Chicago is um, single use bags are out at stores 10,000 square feet or above franchise or chain. And now we have more solid waste in the waste stream because stores are giving away thicker plastic bags and paper bags. And those are, have all just supplanted the single use plastic. And those bags, I should add, are several times more expensive as the single-use plastic bags, which are two cents. The, the thicker plastic bags that we're now giving, that stores here are giving away, are six cents. So not only is this worse for the environment, and we have more solid waste in our landfills and more in our environment, we are paying, consumers are paying three, four times the amount. We're paying millions and millions of dollars more through overhead, because that that cost is just passed on to us, for a worse environmental problem. So I've been pounding the pavement, lobbying aldermen to amend this ordinance and mandate that retailers attach a fee to all bags. Thank you, Jordan. Um, we, we're getting a lot of questions. I'm going to try and um, get one more before we, pa um, we move on, um, just to, in the essence of time. Um, let's see. Lots of good questions. Um, Jennifer, uh, from she's from the south suburbs of Illinois, uh, says, we have launched a start a bag campaign in our suburb, but are having a very hard time locating a retailer to partner with uh, that we can give our bags to. Uh, do you have any suggestions for her? And um, anyone else have any suggestions um, for, for their uh, campaign? Okay, so you're trying to find a, a retailer to give your reusable bags to, to, to market your reusable bags? Uh, I believe, yes, that's what she's, that's what she's saying. Okay, I, um, I think
think it's really about building relationships. It's about having a really solid ask, having a solid campaign, having a lot of support um, in, in local environmental organizations and aldermen or council members, we call them aldermen here in Chicago. Um, it, when you have a lot of momentum behind you, you can approach these retailers one-on-one um, -on -one and hopefully build a relationship and talk to them human to human. Um, Abby, activist Abby, who lives in Grace Lake, Illinois, just did something really great with Jewel, which is a major chain here in Illinois. She um, met with them. She had to go through a lot of meetings um, with her local, um, local city council and Jewel went through a lot of meetings and stayed very tenacious. And Jewel agreed to declare September reusable bag month. So they're doing a lot of promotional stuff at their, at their store. And it's really, really impactful. This is really important to do that work to come from the community education side. So I don't know if that's a very good answer, but that's the first thing that came to mind. Thank you, Jordan. Um, Anna, I think we should move on, right? Yeah, that's great. And we'll, we'll try and we'll have some time at the end if, if we have some Yeah, I'm, I'm collecting the questions. So if we have time um, to address more of them. Great. Um, so uh, Chris uh, with the uh, Department of Energy and the Environment is a specialist in the District of Columbia. Um, he manages implementation of several water pollution control programs um, that include the district's fee on disposable bags and the district's upcoming ban on foam food containers, which is, you know, another step um, towards, um, you know, combating plastic pollution. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. Um... Like Anna said, my name is Christopher Kibler. Um, I'm with the DC Department of Energy and Environment. I'm an environmental protection specialist. Um, our bag law went into effect in 2010. Um, we did a 2008 study of the types of trash found in our water bodies. Um, it was a systematic study, and we found that um, plastic bags were one of the top four types of trash in our water bodies. Um, the other three were snack wrappers, which are pretty hard to address, um, styrofoam, which we're banning starting in January, um, and then bottles, which are a big question mark for the district. Um, and so when we talk about trash pollution in the district, we're really doing so, um, you know, thinking about our, our downstream water bodies. Um, we have two major rivers in the district. One's the Anacostia, one is the Potomac, uh, but both of those drain into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so as we're talking about trash, we're really, we're doing so with the Chesapeake Bay in mind. Um, so I'm gonna give a brief overview of our legislation. Um, I think Jordan did a great job at talking about the why. Um, I'm going to talk about the specifics and, you know, moving beyond the why and towards the how. Um, and I think crafting effective legislation is really essential to promoting behavior change um, and avoiding some of the pitfalls that Jordan mentioned, um, you, know, you know, that can put pretty sizable loopholes in some of these laws um, and, and really negate the environmental benefits. Um, so we have two sets of requirements with our law. Um, the first is the bag fee, which is, I think, most of what we're talking about today. Um, so in D.C., businesses are required to charge a five-cent fee uh, for both paper and plastic bags. Um, we're pretty insistent on the fact that it's important to charge for both paper and plastic um, because um, if, if you don't charge for paper as well, um, there's no incentive for the customer to stop using disposable bags. You know, what they're going to do is they're going to switch from plastic bags, um, they're going to move over to paper bags and, and presumably still use every bit as many. Um, and, and that being the case, um, businesses end up having to pay a lot more. You know, a plastic bag might cost, might cost around two cents for a business, where a paper bag could be seven to nine cents. Um, and so if you don't put that fee on both plastic and paper bags, um, you're not going to reduce bag usage. You're just going to shift a whole bunch of costs to the business that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and so that's why, our, um, that's why our law applies to both paper and plastic bags. Um, we also have certain material and labeling requirements. Um, which I think are more unique to our jurisdiction. Um, the bags must be recyclable, um, so they have to be made of LDPE or HDPE, um, which are the two most common types of plastic. Um, your, your typical grocery store bag is an HDPE bag. Um, the LDPE is some of the thicker bags that you might see at like a, a nicer retailer or an athletic store or something like that. Um, we don't allow compostable bags. Um, Jordan mentioned that you know it's a tricky issue. Um, I don't think there's really the infrastructure to compost right now. Um, and so we do require recyclable bags, but we don't allow compostable bags. 
Um, bags themselves will say, please recycle this bag. Um, that was something that was put in by our council to promote recycling behavior, um, which is great. Um, and then paper bags also must contain 40% post-consumer recycled content. Um, and again, that, that's to reduce um, you know, the environmental footprint of those bags. Um, we do have a few exemptions. I think they're pretty common sense exemptions. Um, paper bags um, distributed at restaurants with seating, that's a really big one. Um, that's for places like McDonald's. Um, so if you go to McDonald's, you get a Happy Meal bag. Um, they're not required to charge for that bag. Um, we also had some of the sit-down restaurants pushing for an option um, for, for doggy bags that they wouldn't have to charge the fee. Um, their argument about it was that it would be awkward, um, you know, once the customers bought a, a $50 meal to then go back and have to charge them an extra five cents. Um, so again, that was, a, that was an exemption that was made at the council level. Um, we haven't had too much of a problem implementing it. Um, and where it's just paper bags, um, you know, from a, from a plastic pollution point of view, um, those bags have much less of an environmental um, impact on the rivers because they break down fairly quickly um, if, they, if they aren't properly disposed of. Um, other exemptions include um, bags that are wrapping raw meats. Um, so if you go to a butcher, you get a raw meat and they wrap it. Um, that's fine. Um, it, we think it helps prevent contamination. Um, same, same thing for produce or baked goods. You know, if you go to the grocery store, get your produce, get your baked goods. Same reason there. You don't want those items to get dirty. Um, so we exempt those from the fee. Um, and then other items where dampness may be a concern. Um, this gets back to meats and some other frozen products, um, you know, where you need to prevent contamination. Um, you know, again, that was exempted at the council level um, to make it more feasible um, for retailers to implement um, the law. Um, and again, we haven't had too much of a problem in implementing those exemptions. Um, and they haven't had a huge um, impact on the environmental benefits of the law. Uh, we do really active enforcement of our law, and I think that's an essential component um, to effective implementation of any bag fee. Um, and when I say active enforcement, I mean we don't just do complaint-based enforcement, um, but we do regular inspections um, of businesses throughout the district. Um, we have about 4,500 regulated businesses at any given time in the district, um, and we inspect about 550 of those in a given year. Um, and the way we do that is through secret shopping. Um, so we'll go into the store, we'll buy an item, um, we'll see if they charge the fee, um, and then if they don't charge the fee, um, we'll follow up with the citation in the mail um, within you know, a week or so after the inspection. Um, the first violation, they get a warning letter, um, and then we'll call the business, we'll work with them to come into compliance. Um, and then after that, the fines ramp up. Um, it starts at 100 and then it doubles um, for every violation after that. Um, and currently fines reset on the calendar year. So if you have um, five violations within a year, each violation is going to be $800. Um, but once the calendar year comes around, you're back to zero. Um, and we can work with the business again. Um, you know, so we'll only be assessing fines back at that $100 level. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll emphasize that enforcement is really crucial. Um, because if you, if you don't have active enforcement of the law, um, businesses aren't going to think that the government is serious about it. Um, and because that we've enforced so consistently over the five years that the law has been in effect, um, we've really seen uh, a lot of gains in terms of um, compliance with the law. Um, so it's hard to see through the webinar app, um, but this is compliance over time, uh, or non-compliance rather. Um, so on the left we have, um, that's fee non-compliance, and then on the right we have non-compliance with the material and labeling requirements. Um, and it's, and um, on the fee non-compliance, um, we're seeing about 5% per year decline in non-compliance. Um, so every year, 5% more businesses um, are coming into compliance with the requirements. Um, and then on the right, um, the material labeling, um, there we're seeing about an 8% per year increase um, in compliance because you know, we're enforcing so actively and they're getting the message. Um, so with material labeling, you know, we're now at less than 10% non-compliance, um, which is really great. Um, and it's great that those, those declines have been so steep and consistent over time. Um, and so, again, I, I would stress really heavily that active enforcement is a really important part of any bag fee if you want to realize um, the environmental benefits um, of that type of law. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about our behavior change. Um, we did a study in 2012 and 2013, um, which followed up on a previous study that we had done just after the logic effect. Um, the study was statistically significant and was both geographically and demographically balanced. Um, and so we're really confident that the numbers that came out of the study are, are very truthful um, to, to actual statistics um, for the district's population as a whole. Um, and so what we're seeing is that 80% of residents are using fewer bags at least some of the time. Um, that might not be all the time, um, but 80% of residents, you know, the bag fee is touching them and has really shaped their behavior. 
Um, and then 79% of businesses report that they're distributing fewer bags to customers. Um, and, and just a point on getting business buy-in for a type of law like this, um, we asked a follow-up question um, to the businesses, you know, when they, when they told us whether or not they were distributing fewer bags, you know, we said, hey, are you saving any money as a result of this law? Um, and one thing that's really crucial is that 50% of businesses reported that they're saving money on their bottom line um, because they're buying fewer bags that they, they previously were just giving away to customers. Um, and so because the businesses are buying fewer bags, um, they're saving money. Um, and so we think that's been really um, beneficial um, for having positive reception from the business community. And then if you look at the number of bags that the average household is using, um, there's been about a 60% decline um, in average household bag use. Um, during our survey, um, uh, the respondents reported that prior to the law took effect, um, their households were using about 10 bags per week on average, um, which puts you at something like 500 bags a year. Um, and they're saying that now they're using only four bags per week on average across their entire household. Um, and so, you know, that's having a really big environmental impact. Um, we have a lot of stream cleanup groups in the district who do um, systematic assessments of the types and sources of trash that they find. Um, so over the last several years, they've counted, um, you know, the types of trash and then how much that trash weighs. Um, and they've seen a 72% decline um, in the number of bags that they're finding in our water bodies. Um, and that's, you know, for us, that's really kind of the golden ticket. Um, it's the environmental indicators that we really care about. Um, and so you know, this is showing that um, the bag law is having a really substantial impact um, on consumer behavior, um, which is then translating to environmental benefits for our water bodies. Um, we do a lot to distribute reusable bags, um, just touching on the, consu the consumer behavior. Um, we distribute um, generally something like 10,000 reusable bags per year. Um, we work with a lot of nonprofit partners throughout the district to make sure that those bags get to low-income populations and also get to senior populations who might not have the same access to those bags. Um, and so we think that you know, continued outreach um, is really important to successful implementation of a law like this um, and making sure that the population is aware of um, you know, how the law is benefiting the environment and how the law is helping to clean up communities. Um, and I think one last point um, that I'm really proud of for our DC law um, is that in the law that created the fee, um, it says that all fee revenues have to go to environmental protection projects. Um, and so that's something that we're really proud of. We've been able to fund a lot of really innovative environmental protection projects um, with fee revenues. Um, we install trash traps in our water bodies, which are like floating cages. Um, and those trash traps have removed 25,000 pounds of trash from our water bodies in the last five years. We also do a lot of education programs, installation of things like rain barrels that reduce stormwater pollution. Um, so I, I think that's a really no, a nice icing on the cake for us on top of the behavior change and the resulting environmental impacts um, is we have this huge funding source now for all sorts of environmental uh, protection projects. Um, and with that, um, I'll wrap up. I'm happy to take questions now or if we want to wait till the end of all of the presentations. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, Tarane, do, do we have uh, two or three questions that we can take now? Um, yeah, I have. I, I can start with one uh, a question here from uh, Brian O'Hara. He says, uh, thicker plastic bags are not good, but are they worse than the lightweight plastic bags when you consider that the lightweight bags have the ability to be carried uh, by the wind into the natural environment? Um, I, I mean, I think it's it's two evils. I don't know which one is the lesser evil or the greater evil. Um, I think it's just two evils, and so we should get rid of both of them, um, personally. Um, we do have a similar exemption to Chicago. Um, so we have an exemption where if plastic bags are larger than I think it's two mils, um, they are exempt. But we really haven't seen businesses take advantage of that exemption. Um, so it's, they ha that hasn't been a concern for us, that particular um, exemption in the law. Um, again, it's two evils. I don't know that one's any better than the other. Thank you. Um, those are all the questions we have um, for Chris. We have more questions, I think, that we could wrap up with at the end. Uh, okay. Thank sure, you so yeah. much, Chris. Thank you. Okay, so now we're moving on to Jenny Romer, who's um, an attorney and the founder of PlasticBagLaws.org. Um, you know, I think from the first two presentations, we're hearing a lot about, you know, how everybody needs to be smarter about, uh, you know, developing and crafting good legislation that will end up in effective um, laws being passed. So Jenny, um, you know, as a national expert on plastic carryout bags policy um, and the coordinator of the Clean Seas Coalition, um, we'll be able to give us some more information about how we can be smart about 
um, the laws. And then you can also uh, tell us a little bit about um, Bagot New York City Coalition. Welcome. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'll just jump right into this. Uh, first, oh, let's see. Okay. Um, a little delay there. So first, I just wanted to, I'm a lawyer, so I'd like to give a disclaimer that this is not legal advice. I'm not your, your lawyer because you're listening to this webinar or watching this webinar. Uh, so if you... You, as a speaking mostly to towns, um, if a town goes forward with this, please consult your own lawyer first. <laughs> this is just a general overview. So I think Jordan went over this already, but just briefly, plastic, why, do, why plastic bags? <laughs> why are we talking about this? Uh, plastic bags have become an icon of waste, uh, mostly because we can just see them. They're very visible. Um, and so if they're, even if they're disposed of properly, they end up getting caught in the wind and they are in trees, they go, go into waterways. Um, another main reason is that they're given away for free. So people don't give a lot of thought to whether they're just, or whether they need a bag and what they're going to do with it after they use it. Uh, and they're used only briefly. They end up in the environment forever. And another main thing is that it's something that people can do something about immediately unlike a lot of environment, other environmental issues. So that can be just bringing your own bag to the store, or it can mean getting involved with local legislation, and it leads to very tangible results. Okay, this is a very overwhelming slide, and um, I've made it that way so that people could reference it later, but I'll just go over it very quickly. So I like to, before talking about what, which structures um, I support, I like to give a history of plastic bag legislation. Um, so the, one of, the first really big legislation was in Ireland. Um, it was a 22 cent euro fee, and that, led, and that was on plastic bags, and it led to a 95% reduction in plastic bag consumption and also corresponding reduction in roadside plastic bag litter and that was kind of the impetus behind or the main impetus behind Ireland's bill. So San Fran a couple of um, com environmental commissioners from T San Francisco went to Ireland, saw how successful this was, this charge, and they came back to San Francisco and made a recommendation to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors to put a 17 cent charge on all single-use bags in San Francisco, um, and that was paper and plastic. And there, I wrote a whole law journal article about this particular um, situation. But what happened was that the um, mayor put kind of a hold on that legislation. And in the meantime, industry groups went to Sacramento and snuck in a little bit of preemption language into a plastic bag recycling bill that said, said that no municipality in California could place a fee or a charge on specifically on single-use plastic bags. So that was a surprise to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors that they could no longer do go forward with, with, with that 17 cent charge legislation. And instead, they decided to ban single-use plastic bags altogether. And that wasn't something the plastics industry saw coming at that time. So um, after that happened, the San Francisco ban inspired other cities in California to go forward with the ban as well. But what happened next was that the city of Oakland adopted a very similar ban, and, but Oakland hadn't, didn't have a lot on the record about it. San Francisco had been studying that issue for a long time. Oakland said, oh, we want to do that too, and went forward. They were sued, and because they didn't have a strong administrative record showing all why plastic bags were bad and had similar legislation worked elsewhere, and, um, and so they lost. And that was a test case by the plastics industry. Um, and, okay. and then, so meanwhile, this kind of jumps over. <laughs> meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., uh, the five-cent charge on all bags, all single-use bags was adopted. 
um, and that led to a 60% reduction, corresponding reduction in litter. And that was a game changer at that time because up until then, the common thinking was that it would take a lot more money to to change consumer behavior as far as um, having a big reduction in the amount of bags people use. So, and flashback to California, uh, what California cities decided to do, because after after the Oakland um, lawsuit, a lot of other California cities were getting sued as they adopted bag bans that didn't address paper. Um, and the big argument that the plastics industry was making um, was that if you ban a plastic bag, customers will just switch to paper. Paper might be worse for the environment, and so you should study that. And you should... You have you. They said that every city would have to complete a full environmental impact report on what on whether paper was worse than plastic. Um, so what California cities did was adopt what I like to call a second generation plastic bag ban. And so that means, and I I coined the term, so I like other people to use it. Um, but what that means is banning thin plastic and then putting a charge on any other type of carryout bag. At first it started just with paper, but now that we've seen with this issue with bigger plastic bags that qualify as reusable being given away for free, um, now it's evolved to be a ban on thin plastic bags, a 10 cent charge on any other bag that you, that you get at the register. So no bags are given away for free. Um, and in California, uh, there is also an issue with, okay, if the if the city is collecting money, then uh, the, the industry argued that would be a tax. Um, so what California cities did was just say the retailer had to collect that 10 cents, but the retailer keeps the money. And so because no money is going to the government, it's not a tax. And that went to the California Court of Appeal, and the count, it was the county of Los Angeles in that case, and the county won because no money went to the government. So uh, this type of ordinance, a second generation ban with a 10 cent charge on all other carryout bags, stands up well to the environmental claim because what we saw in LA County was the result was that there was a 95% reduction in carryout bag use overall, and that included, you know, uh, it also included a 30% reduction in in paper bag use. Um, so that really addressed the environmental claim. Okay, what happened next was San Francisco adopted and implemented an expanded ordinance. Um, and I worked, I spent a lot of, oh, okay, don't, you're cheating and looking at the next slide. <laughs> Um, San Francisco adopted and implemented an expanded ordinance. I spent a lot of time personally working on that. And I lived in San Francisco at the time. And that was to address, oh, oh no. Um, hmm. Let's see if it stays there. Oh, no. Okay. Um, Okay, back to the San Francisco slide. Let's see if it stays. It looks like it's going to. Um, so the problem with San Francisco was that, uh, similar to what Jordan's experiencing in Chicago, with when there was just a ban on thin plastic bags, paper bags were giving, being given away for free, as well as thicker plastic bags. And so I lived there, and I had volunteered with a supervisor's office that wrote the original ban, and I went into my local grocery store and they gave me a thicker bag for free and I freaked out. <laughs> um, so then I became involved with helping rewrite that legislation over the period of um, the next two, two or three years. So it took a long time, but we, what we ended up with is what I think is one of the strongest laws in the country, which is a ban on thin plastic bags, a 10 cent charge on all other bags. And it applies to every retailer and every restaurant in the city. Uh, which is very expansive. Um, what happened next, or what was happening uh, on the East Coast at that time, is that a lot of New York City area um, communities, 
suburban communities around New York City were adopting straight plastic bag bans. Um, I moved to New York in 2012 to try to convince the city council to move forward with a bill, which ended up being a, it was introduced in 2013, it's a 10 cent fee on all carry out bags. Uh, that is still before the city council, I'm still waiting, basically waiting to hear what the mayor has to say about it. He has not weighed in yet. Um, but what's happening in around New York City is that a lot of the suburban towns that have adopted bans, um, you know, we are, we're waiting, or a lot of them are wanting to continue to adopt bans um, in, in mostly in Westchester and Long Island, um, but they've slowed down because there was a lawsuit that was filed by the Food Industry Alliance, which is the Grocers Association, they filed it against a very small town called Hastings on Hudson. And again, they used the similar environmental claims uh, that we saw in California. But uh, we haven't heard back from the court. And, and they are just straight, they are just straight plastic bag bans. So the big concern is weighing the issue of is paper better than plastic? Um, what I am trying to do is work with cities to move forward with with a fee or charge rather than a ban. And like I said, so we can avoid that whole issue of paper versus plastic and just go for an overall reduction. Um, and the, one of the reasons, I'll also mention that the reason why, attend, why that plaintiff is a grocer association um, generally is that um, it costs grocers a lot more when you when you ban plastic bags if you ban thin plastic bags generally and you don't say anything else about other types of carry out bags grocers um will then have to give away free bags to or not have to but they will give away free paper and thicker plastic bags to their customers and that costs them more money um traditional plastic bags are one to two cents Paper bags might be eight to ten cents if they have high post-consumer recycled content, and um, the thicker plastic bags used to be ten to fifteen cents. But I think that cost has gone down quite a bit, but they're still much more expensive than than the thin plastic bags. So, um, so it's in the grocer's interest, um, as business interest, to be able to continue to give away the cheap ones. Um, so even though the environmental claims are involved, that's kind of the background to that. And lastly, Jordan, I think, talked about this a lot, is that the bans have been implemented in major cities recently in Chicago and Honolulu. And I was involved in Chicago as well, trying to say, you know, please put a charge on this. Don't don't just adopt a ban and then fix it, go back and fix it later. Try to get it right the first time. Um, but but now it looks like we have to go back and fix it, hopefully. Um, okay, so this is a, a pretty dense slide, but it's just wrapping up what I have already talked about. The main things that we have to be concerned with from a legal perspective when adopting uh, a, some, a plastic bag ordinance is first the environmental claim of, and that is for the most part just involves, is could paper be worse than plastic? Um, and that is a question that the, industry, the plastics industry says requires a full environmental impact report. Uh, some cities have spent upwards of $100,000 to prepare similar reports. And um, I say no, just to get, have a, a ordinance that involves a fee so that you see an overall reduction. Um, and then secondly is the taxation claim where if a fee is involved, um, make sure the safest bet generally is to make sure that the money stays with the retailer so that none goes to the government and therefore it's not a tax. Um, but in some, depends where you are. Washington DC is not a state. They don't have to worry about it um, because unconstitutional taxation claims arise because the state's general or local municipalities cannot are not authorized to collect taxes unless they're authorized by the state. Washington DC doesn't have that problem. Um, and it and you can and some municipalities can get around that uh, with a regulatory fee um, saying that it's collected for a specific purpose and going to a specific fund. 
um, to do very certain specific things, um, like addressing harms that are caused by plastic bags. But that really depends on the state. And in Colorado, they were successful in arguing for that. Uh, Aspen was. So um, I have a lot of information on my website about that if you'd like more. And then the last thing is preemption by statewide um, bag bills. Um, and so that can be either, like I mentioned, in California, where it was very specific to no charges, um, or in Florida, where right now in Florida, no municipality can adopt any kind of plastic bag ban and le or plastic bag legislation at all until the state legislature moves forward. So, um, yeah, it depends on the state. So, summary, the types of, um, types of ordinances that I would recommend, would not, not recommend a straight plastic bag ban for the reasons we've talked about. Um, the, the two types that I would recommend are either the California style second generation ban that includes a 10 cent charge on any other types of carryout bags. And then I also would recommend a charge on all carryout bags. And that is, um, that's what New York City has proposed. And I wrote a law journal article um, all about that. So that is it. I think I went a little over. I'm sorry about that. Are there no, any thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, so it looks like we have four minutes. Um, and sorry. one of the questions that, um, uh, you know, now we, we have a lot of really useful information. Uh, one of the questions that I want to get right to is, um, I see one from Shruti Khanna, and he's asking, he's in high school, um, they started a high school club, and their question is, how would you recommend they go about promoting the reduction of plastic bags um, in order to get a really enthusiastic response where they are in their school? Um, so what, what kind of tips would you give him? Because, you know, I'm really intrigued by this because it really starts with young folk um, like mm -hmm. him. Right. And I think, I think reaching out to the council member um, depends where you are with your city council or aldermen or whatever they're called. Um, and especially the one that uh, either the district that you live in or the district where your school is, because council members really want to hear from their constituents and their constituents are the ones that reelect them. So meeting with them, meeting with the council member first and like Jordan, Jordan used the term champion, finding a legislative champion, some politician that is interested in this idea can really be helpful in figuring out the best way to move forward. And also looking for other groups, like depending on where you are, like surf rider or a group that cares about your local waterways might already have some program. So figure out if there's anyone else that cares about it near you and talk with them. Great. Um, so, um, Karen, a, we have time for one last question. Okay. Um, well, there is, um, there is a, an interesting statement. I think that um, there was some response to it, but um, I think it would be good to bring it to the group uh, from Steve Finn. One objection I have heard it about Banning plastic bags is that uh, lots of households use those bags as kitchen garbage, uh, which they then put in the trash. Similarly, paper bags are used to gather recyclables. Uh, suggestions on what to use if these bags are eliminated. Can I respond to that? I will. Oh, go ahead. Oh, really quickly. Um, I think one of the misconceptions is that when we pass bag legislation that all plastic bags are going to disappear and all paper bags are going to disappear overnight. Unfortunately, we're still going to be able to find single-use plastic bags for many, many years to come. So the amount of plastic bags that people really use is, is very small compared, like reuse once for, to line a garbage can or something, is very small to the overall consumption. So I would say um, don't even worry about that. You'll still be able to find one bag here and there for your trash can. Um, a note on docks. I had a German Shepherd for 13 years, so I'm well aware of the, of the um, dog waste issue. What I tell people, it's really simple. Um, collect plastic film that comes into your household. It's everywhere. Produce bags, bags that your toilet paper comes in, bread bags, paper towel bags. I mean, it plastic film is everywhere. So if you save it, 
you can just use that to pick up your pet, pet waste. Thank you. Okay, so thanks everyone. Um, just a quick um, next steps. Uh, we'll be making this webinar available to everyone. Um, we'll include resources from all of the guest speaker organizations. Um, so you can uh, go back to either the presentations or additional resources that they have on their various websites and um, go forth and let's uh, ban plastic bags um, wherever you live. Thanks again. Or put AP. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good Thanks day. Everyone. Bye. Bye.